Okay, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Um, so glad that everybody's here. Welcome to the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Um, I'm Lisa Vinach. I'm the Senior Vice President of Corporate Communications and Engagement, and we're so pleased that you're all here for tonight's Fed Talk event. Um, Fed Talk is our new public speaker series that was launched earlier this year in which we share relevant research um, to our community and ask that you join us in a discussion. Um, I, before we uh, get the program going, I want to tell you a little bit about the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Um, so the Cleveland Fed is one of 12 regional reserve banks that, along with the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., comprise the Federal Reserve System. Part of the U.S. Central Bank, the Cleveland Fed participates in the formulation of our nation's monetary policy, supervises banking institutions, provides payment and other services to financial institutions and to the U.S. Treasury, as well as performing many other activities that support the Federal Reserve System. In addition, the Cleveland Fed supports the well-being of communities across our district through a wide array of research, outreach, and educational activities. Um, the Cleveland Fed represents the 4th District, which includes all of Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Kentucky, and the Panhandle of West Virginia. So tonight, we'll, we'll learn what is behind the persistence of the racial wealth gap based on research done by Cleveland Fed economists Dionisi Alaprantis and Dan Carroll, along with Eric Young, who is on leave from the University of Virginia. Um, but, but before we get into that, I have the honor of introducing our moderator for today, Jennifer Jordan. Jennifer, a two-time award-winning journalist, joined WJW-TV Fox 8 News in January 2020, 2012 as the noon anchor and reporter for the evening newscast. Jennifer, a native New Yorker, an currently anchors the 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. primetime weekend newscast and has been in the television news industry for 25 years. For nearly eight years here in Cleveland, Jennifer has reported on some of the biggest stories in Northeast Ohio, including continuous coverage of the three women rescued after 10 years of being kidnapped, the Chardon school shooting, the Republican National Convention, and the 2016 Cavs NBA Championship. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Jordan. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you so much, everyone, for coming out tonight. We greatly appreciate it. The format for this evening's program will be a presentation by Dan Carroll, research economist here at the Cleveland Fed, followed by a panel discussion of our experts seated here to my right and community leaders, and then we'll end with a Q&A with you, our audience. You see the microphones up here, and during our Q&A sessions, we will ask that uh, if you have a question, to please come and step up and ask your question. If someone's in front of you, kindly just make a line down the aisle. And with that, with that allow me to introduce to you our illustrious presenter and panel. Daniel R. Carroll, Research Economist, Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Daniel Carroll is an economist in the research department of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. His primary fields of interest are macroeconomics, public finance, and political economy. His research broadly focuses on the interactions between income and wealth and important macroeconomic issues such as neighborhood effects, fiscal policy, and growth. Dr. Carroll earned his BA in Economics from Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington, and his PhD in Economics from the University of Virginia. Dionisi Alaprantis, Senior Research Economist, Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. He is primarily interested in applied economics, econometrics, am I pronouncing that word correctly? I should know this, right? Labor and urban economics and education. His current work investigates neighborhood effects on education and labor market outcomes. Dr. Alaprantis joined the Cleveland Reserve Bank in 2010. He earned a BS in mathematics and a BA in economics and Spanish from Indiana University. And he holds a PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania. Eric Young, Professor of Economics, University of Virginia. 
Eric is a professor at the University of Virginia who is currently on sabbatical with the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Young is a frequent visitor and consultant to the Federal Reserve Banks of Cleveland, Dallas, and Kansas City, as well as an adjunct professor of economics at Zhejiang University in China, John Hopkins University, Baltimore, and the University of California at Santa Barbara. He is an associate editor at the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control of Economics Letters, as well as an advisor for the Laboratory of Aggregate Economics and Finance at US UCSB. Young holds a BA in Economics and Politics from Washington and Lee University and a PhD in economics from Carnegie Mellon University. Randall McShepard was elected Vice President Public Affairs in, two, in October 2007 and named Chief Talent Officer in July 2018. He is primarily responsible for coordinating external affairs for the company, including corporate philanthropy, and government relations, as well as managing and evaluating senior leadership development, succession planning, and executive training across RPM. Mr. McShepard began his career at RPM in 2001 when he joined the company as Director of Community Affairs. His previous work included serving as Executive Director of City Year Cleveland and Assistant Director of Administration and Program Development for the Cleveland Bicentennial Commission. Mr. McShepard is very active in the Cleveland community, serving as a trustee for Baldwin Wallace University and the George Gunn Foundation and a Director of Taylor Oswald LLC. He is also the Chairman and Co-Founder of Policy Bridge a public policy think tank serving the Northeast Ohio region. His professional affiliations include his current role as Chairman of the Manufacturing Advocacy Council of the National Association of Manufacturing. Mr. McShepard holds dual Bachelor of Arts degrees from Baldwin Wallace University and a Master of Science degree in Urban Studies from Cleveland State University. He and his wife, Gail, reside in Beechwood and have three children. Jill Rizica, Executive Director Towards Employment. Jill Rizica is Executive Director responsible for the overall operations of $5.4 million nonprofit agency with 55 staff, which delivers quality employment services for low income greater Clevelanders and helps local businesses fill their staffing needs. The agency helps over 200 people every year prepare for a job find a job, keep a job, or advance in a career. She transformed an innovative job retention program into a revenue generating stream for the agency and strengthened programming to meet employment needs of individuals with a criminal background, doubling the number of placed jobs on an annual basis. She has overseen implementation of an employer-driven employer-driven job training model that successfully connects residents of economically distressed neighborhoods to anchor employer jobs, as well as a national demonstration grant, Work Advance, that resulted in higher earnings for low-income participants relative to a control group. In 2015, Towards Employment launched a social enterprise Bloom Artisan Bakery and Cafe, creating jobs and training opportunities for Towards Employment graduates. In 2014, Ms. Rizica was recognized as a White House Champion of Change for her work on creating employment opportunities for individuals involved in the criminal justice system and received the Pillar Award for Nonprofit Executive Director of the Year. She has been named a Northeast Ohio Smart 50 Executive by Smart Business Magazine 2016 and a Cranes Business Magazine Woman of Note 2019. She is a member of Leadership Cleveland, Class of 2012. Prior to moving to Cleveland, Ms. Rizica spent 15 years working in international development for several international organizations, including the United Nations Development Program. She has a BA from Dartmouth, College and a Master's in Public and International Affairs from the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. Let's give our panel 
a big round of applause tonight. And Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Right. Thank you, Jennifer, for the warm introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming out tonight to, to hear about our research and to, and to really engage in it. I just uh, wanted to just take a moment to say that um, we still have ongoing research interests in this area. And, and um, so I see you all as kind of participants in helping us uh, understand more about uh, this important topic. OK, so I think, to be honest, I feel more comfortable if I just I'm going to try to turn this on here, and I'm going to move just a little bit. So bear with me. I hope you really hear me. Great. This is great. I feel a lot more comfortable when I step out from behind the podium. Appreciate it. OK, so this is joint work with Dean Cialic Prantis and Eric Young um, on the racial wealth gap. Now, before I begin, I should read the disclaimer that these are our views and not necessarily the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland or of the Federal Reserve System. OK. so. We're going to be talking about the racial wealth gap, and I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page about what that means, OK? So first, I want to start with unpacking what wealth is. So we are on the same page here. So we can think of wealth as financial assets, which you, what you own, minus whatever you owe, your debts, OK? So we have some pictures with some examples. It could be stocks and bonds in a retirement account. It could be the value of your house, less the mortgage. Um, it could be the change in your pocket or money in your banking accounts. So any of that is wealth, and it, we would even call it net worth, okay? So that's what we're going to look at in the data, the difference between the financial assets you have and, the, and what you've borrowed. Now, okay, so what we're going to be doing is, is thinking about a lot of, of data as well as a model, okay? And in both the data and models, it's helpful to think sometimes of representative households behind all this, all these numbers. So for those of you who, who it's helpful for, we can think of bakers and weavers as two representative families, okay, one black and one white. Um, and so as I start pulling up averages and showing you numbers, you can also keep this in the back of your mind. Okay. So let's start with the data. Now, this is all from a survey called the Survey of, of Consumer Finances from the Federal Reserve Board. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, survey of, of wealth, particularly of wealth uh, for U.S. households. Now, if you go back to 1962, so this is the first real wave that we have of the SCF, the Survey of Consumer Finances, and you ask, what is the average level of wealth for a black-headed household in the United States? Okay, this is in 2016 dollars, so approximately the value we have today. The average wealth is $20,000, okay, $20,000 of wealth. Now compare that to the white-headed uh, counterparts at $138,000. So white-headed households had approximately seven times more wealth. About, or you could put it as a black-headed household, the ratio there, that, that had about 14% of white wealth. So what do we mean by a gap then? Well, the gap is what makes up that difference. So you can see it's that light blue region there. And that would be measured at 86%. So that's an 86% wealth gap okay, between average black-headed household, average white-headed household. This is in 1962. Okay? Now, for a little, you know, for historical context, um, you know, some might say, well, 1962, a long time ago, you might not find it really that surprising there'd be a big disparity in, in, in wealth between these households. And, and why is that? Well, it's because leading up to that time, we have hundreds of years of structural violence, right, of, of laws that are explicit, explicitly aimed at suppressing wealth for black households, right? And so, in the light of that, in light of slavery and, 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 and even after Civil War Reconstruction, Jim Crow, financial and, and residential sorting restrictions, right? All these things were aimed at suppressing black wealth. And, and so in light of that, it's not maybe so surprising there would be a massive disparity there. However, if we keep moving forward a little bit, there was legislation passed in the 1960s that, at least under the law, would seem to be aimed at 
at removing some of those barriers. So we had the Civil Rights Act, we had Voting Rights Act, we had Fair Housing Act. So there was a lot of legislation that, again, at least under the law, would seem to make the playing field better. Okay, so we said, well, we have this data for 1962, right? And I said there was an 86% wealth gap, and that's shown right here in this purple dot. So that's coming out of the Survey of Consumer Finances. What happens as we move this forward in time? And that's the answer. So each of the dots are for the waves of the survey that are available to us. So it picks up again in 1983 and then moves forward every three years from there and ends in 2016. Effectively, the wealth gap hasn't changed. Okay, there's little movements, but in a statistical, from a statistical sense, that is a flat gap. It hasn't closed at all. So there's some different you know, hypotheses behind why that might be so. Um, and we're going to investigate some of them here tonight. Um, we're going to actually really focus on three. So one would be that there might be differences in the returns that people earn on their savings, right? So when you in invest your money somewhere, if you um, you've bought a house and it's appreciating, um, if you, you know, put your money in a bank and, and get some return on your savings, these are all returns on your wealth, all returns that are paid to you for not consuming today, but instead saving it. Um, there's some research around this. It's, it's not clear whether there is a, still a systematic large difference in returns, but it is a possibility we're going to explore. Another is that there could just be differences in inheritances that are driving this, right? We know that there was a huge difference between the average black household and average white household in terms of wealth available. That you would expect to persist over generations through the inheritances, right? You just have less to give than white-headed households, and so the children start out with more wealth, and it perpetuates. The third is something we're going to really delve into, which is a difference in earnings. Okay, So what is a difference in earnings? It's important that we make the distinction between earnings and wealth. So where wealth was kind of the value of all the stuff that you have, less, your, less what you owe, earnings you can think of as your paycheck. It's what you get in the labor market. Okay, It's the combination of what you get paid for your time at work and how much you work. Okay, now why is earnings something of interest to us here? Well, this is coming from the same survey. If you just look at earnings, you see that there's also a gap, and it's pretty big. It's a 40% gap. In other words, on average, a black-headed household makes 60% of the labor income of a white household. Okay, so there's just less income coming through the labor market channel to save from. Moreover, it's been very persistent. And again, it wiggles a little bit, but it's basically flat. That hasn't changed either. Moreover, this wealth gap is present at all levels of earnings. So here, we've plotted out earnings in thousands of dollars at the bottom. So this is what they're making in the labor market. And then we've plotted wealth, right, by race. And you can see that no matter what earnings level you're at, there's a difference. This is actually taken from a snapshot in time. This is from actually recent data. This is the last two waves of that survey. Um, but it also can be a little bit misleading to only look at a snapshot when we talk about wealth, OK? Because wealth is accumulated over time. If you just looked at this, you might even say, actually, as earnings rises, it seems like there's a larger wealth gap. So maybe the earnings gaps and wealth gaps aren't related that much at all. And in fact, some statistical research that kind of focuses on this static view, has asked the question, why can't we explain more of the wealth gap? Well, that's what motivated us to do this work. Because we said we know that saving and accumulating wealth is a dynamic process, and so we wanted to have a dynamic perspective in our research. So how do we do that? Well, we build a model, OK? I mean, one, one way that you can kind of think of it is if you, if you think about how astronomers sometimes study the early universe, they construct a model of how these processes would have happened, and they kind of initiate it at some beginning point in time, and then they simulate it changing, right? And they study the early universe. Well, in a, in a similar way, we're going to do something like that. We're going to take a model, a canonical model for macroeconomics to study inequality among households that tells us how households save and work and consume, and which can match broad facts about that behavior. And then we're going to augment it a little bit in order to answer our, answer our question. So we're going to add to that racial differences. So there will be 
there'll be races in the model. Um, there'll be age, so people will sort of grow older and they'll retire, they'll save to give inheritances. Um, and they'll also have differences in their income and their wealth just from making optimal choices in their environment. Okay, so then once we have that, then we start the economy off in 1962. So we, we make sure that it looks like the picture that, that we see in, from the 1962 data. And then we're going to feed in to the model different processes, differences in earnings, differences in inheritances, maybe differences in returns. And we're going to see how that affects the path of the wealth gap. Okay, so we can see we're back to, to kind of again, back to our families. So we have these representative families kind of in, a, in this model, right? We have two types of, of families here. And then I want to make clear as we go through the experiments what's turned on and what's turned off, okay? So to get a baseline, get a baseline for our model, we first want to make sure that it actually produces the wealth gap that we've seen, okay? It's not clear that you're going to get that. It's not obvious that it's going to arise. We aren't forcing the model to do it. We're just adding the ingredients that we see and, and when we're asking the model what it says. So for the baseline, we're going to, we're going to assume that both black households and white households get the same return on their savings, but we're going to give them differences in their inheritances, those are intergenerational transfers, right? So white households are going to have larger intergenerational transfers. They're going to have a larger earnings on average, so it will be an earnings gap. And since we're starting them in 1962 with all that inequality and wealth, they're going to have differences in their initial wealth. So that's what we're going to start from as our baseline, and then we're going to see how it does. So here's a picture. In the purple, we've got the data that I had shown before on the wealth gap. The black line is the wealth gap that the model produces. And as you can see, it's actually quite close. It produces a persistent and very large racial wealth gap. OK. So now that we have something that a baseline to start from, we can start asking how changes to the model would change the prediction for the wealth gap and what's behind this persistent gap. So the first thing we're going to do is test this idea of, of no return gap. We're going to turn one on. So this, everywhere I highlight in green, this, we've turned something on from the baseline. So here now, instead of having the same return on savings, we'll also give the weavers an advantage in, the, in terms of the return that they get on their savings. And in fact, because it's unclear what that might be from the data, we're actually going to make it very large. So in this case, the weavers are going to get three times the return on their savings. So a very, very large return difference. If we feed that into the model, okay, uh, the black line, which might be difficult to see there, is still the baseline. The red line is when we add in this return gap. And as you can see, the model's not picking up much difference, even with a very large return gap. So it's not putting much weight on returns as, as driving the, lab, the, the, uh, the wealth gap that we saw. In other words, we, you know, we could have started the model with the return gap and then removed it, but it wouldn't have made a very big difference. So we said, OK, we went back to our baseline. So now we have the same return on wealth, and we're going to change something else. So here we equalize inheritances. So black households and white households in our model are going to get the same expected inheritance. Now. That's the blue line, rather than the baseline, and that, that gets you somewhere, right? That does have some action, um, and over about 50 years, it opens up into about a 10 percentage point difference in, in the wealth gap, so it reduces it somewhat. But again, it doesn't seem to be what's really driving it. So finally, we, we turn that back off, and we go to the earnings gap, and we eliminate it. We ask, well, what if in 1962, hypothetically, we could have erased the earnings gap right away? Black and white households would, on average, have received the same paychecks, so to speak. And you get a picture like that. The, the, the wealth gap disappears fairly quickly, at least relative to the baseline. Um, and so it would actually have predicted under that scenario that we would, we would have a wealth gap under 10%, maybe closer to 5 Okay, so it seems like the earnings gap's where all the power is at. In fact, to kind of reinforce this, we, we run another, another experiment. So go back to our baseline, the earnings gap's back, and we, again, we control the environment. We get to control this little laboratory, if you will, our, our, our economy, and we shuffle wealth around in the beginning so that 
there is no racial wealth gap, okay? We just redistribute everything across households so that by race, wealth is the same. But we leave the differences in the paychecks there and the differences in inheritances. What happens? Well, in 1962, the wealth gap is zero by construct, right? But it quickly begins to reemerge because there's still this persistent difference in the income that the black households in this model are earning relative to their white counterparts. So this says to us that sort of one-time large wealth transfers, they, they, may, they, do, they are effective initially, obviously, for, for, by construction, for reducing the gap. But unless you also address other inequalities, particularly the earnings gap, you shouldn't expect the, the gains to be long-lasting. Okay, so to, as I get ready to wrap up and we go to our discussion, um, everything I've shown so far has been asking the model what would have happened from 1962 forward if, right, we changed this or that. And we've seen that the earnings gap is really important. But I want to leave us with, well, what could we expect going forward? What would the model suggest going forward? And I think, as I, I hope I've convinced many of you, that it really depends on what you think the earnings gap is going to do in the future. So we run a couple different scenarios. So this is a scenario where we, as, we believe or we assume, I should say we assume, that the earnings gap begins to disappear slowly every year, year over year, and it slows at a rate, it disappears at a rate so that it is gone by 2069. That's 50 years from now. So in 50 years, it's gone. Now, 50 years might seem like a long time, but I want to remind you, the data for the last 60 years, it hasn't changed at all. Okay? So this is, would be, by those standards, relatively, relatively quick. This is what you get. The green line is the wealth gap. Okay, it starts up there at 86%, right, which is where it's at today. And it begins to decline as the earnings gap shrinks. And then that, that black arrow indicates where the earnings gap has finally completely disappeared. And by that point, you still have about a 50% gap in wealth. Okay? But because you're in an environment where the earnings gap has gone at that point, it continues to decrease. So that over 100 years, you finally get very close to the same level. So, I mean, you can look at this a couple different ways, of course. But, I mean, one thing I think should be, be apparent is that, at least in the model, it's going to take time for these things to unwind, even under what I think, um, at least relative to the data, might be very optimistic view, okay, for, for the earnings gap. Um, okay, what if we go with the long view? In this case, we're assuming 400 years of time for the earnings gap to disappear. 400 years, long time. Um, and I think it's maybe kind of a hard one to really think about. I think a lot would change, hopefully, in the United States in 400 years. But this is just about trying to think about if that earnings gap goes very, very, very slowly. Okay? If that earnings gap changes very, very slowly, well, the same thing happens for the racial wealth gap. It's extremely slow to change. And just to kind of really hammer the point home, what if we just left it permanently different? and didn't do anything, then it would never change. That's the top line there. So the top line is the permanent change, the permanently unchanged. That's just never closes. Okay. So again, this all underscores what? The earnings gap we think is critical for addressing the racial wealth gap, that we have to find ways to, to close that difference in earnings. Um, there's a lot of, of sources behind that. They're not addressed in this paper. But, I mean, just to throw out some, and I, and I, I hope the panel will, will have some, some ideas, too. Um, you could think about labor market discrimination that still, per, that still exists. Um, you can think about differences in neighborhoods and schools and the resources that are available that lead to skills gaps for, for children, um, and also to, to incarceration and the, and the criminal justice system that, that affects communities differently. So these are just some of the ideas that are out there. There are many, and it's stuff that we really are excited to study in future research. So we look forward to all of your your questions and, and, um, and ideas. So thank you very much. Um, with that, I will turn it back over to Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. We will now begin our panel discussion with the first question going to Randy McShepard. Randy, thinking about the recently released policy bridge report on leadership, what is the responsibility of, in particular, black leaders in addressing the racial wealth gap? OK, 
Can you hear me? Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I would say uh, that I could give a fit talk just on that one question, but uh, I, I won't do that. I think um, there's many, many things that African Americans can do to address this challenge. Uh, first and foremost, we have to get involved. We have to ask the questions. We have to be at the table. Um, I'll give you an example. I was very involved in the early days of the establishment of the Fund for Economic Future. And many of you know that's a regional economic uh, development or intermediary type organization that is uh, working with great institutions like the Fed to try to move the regional economy forward. And <clears throat> we were struck by the fact that the fund had created a regional council of economic advisors, which were very smart guys like the three uh, here that are economists and uh, several economists from other local universities. And we, uh, we being Policy Bridge, the think tank I'm involved with, asked the question about why don't we have any African Americans sitting on that council? And uh, after about a week or two, um, I was contacted and told We've searched high and low, and there are no African-American PhD economists in Cleveland. And I said, wow, you know, I know there's lots of PhDs, but PhD economists was a different story. So as a Constellation Prize, um, the group agreed to allow a couple of us from, um, two of us from Policy Bridge, and I think one person from the Urban League, to sit on that council. And uh, obviously, while we can't crunch numbers the way the, these uh, great economists can, we certainly could bring perspectives to the argument, to the, the work at hand. And I think that um, being in the room and, and adding voice and adding perspective goes a very, very long way and adds color and um, context to the, these kinds of discussions. So that, that would be one piece of it. I also think that um, we have to organize to figure out ways that we can sort of lead change on our own. And uh, one great example of that would be the President's Council, where a group of uh, business leaders, African Americans, came together and said, we know what we need. We know um, how we can best uh, position our companies to uh, thrive in this regional economy, and how can we sort of work as a team of uh, entrepreneurs to uh, educate and to bring perspective again to um, the, the larger challenge. Um, I also think that um, we as an African American community really have to pay close attention to one of my favorite areas, workforce development. Um, I think that wealth creation to a great extent is heavily dependent on workforce development. And I won't steal my dear friend Jill's uh, thunder, but um, when you think about uh, you know, middle class, black America, you know, when I grew up, we were low, lower middle class, um, working, you know, most of our family were, was blue collar. But um, the fact that they were able to hold down a job, buy a home, uh, build equity in that home, and when they retired, at least there was some equity that could help them with retirement and those kinds of things. And of course, many were able to send their kids to college. That's, uh, a far cry from the kinds of uh, extensive wealth that, that uh, was referenced in the uh, presentation. And, and I read the, the paper, and I thought it was spot on where they talked about uh, <clears throat> where wealthy people tend to make their money is in the stock market and things like real estate and those kinds of things. Well, we know as a community of color, we, we probably would need a whole lot more to be able to get to that place. But uh, the next best thing would be to be gainfully employed uh, over a period of years, buy a home and, and uh, perhaps um, at least have some equity. And, and I stress the home piece because many of you may know when the foreclosure crisis hit, that was the biggest onslaught to African American wealth of anything in the nation's history. The, the amount of uh, wealth that was lost because people that had re you know equity in their homes saw it all wash away. And um, so that goes to show the, the, the importance of just holding down a job and, and being able to create wealth in even a smaller, uh, uh, less significant way. So I'll, I'll stop with that and uh, allow my uh, colleagues to get in on this conversation. Jill Rizica, there we go. 
Can you talk about some of the contributing factors to the wage gap, which this study has identified as a critical driver of the wealth gap? Joe? Yes, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to, to be here and for that research that shows so dramatically um, the importance of earnings and of changing the trajectory of that line. Um, so just to um, talk a little bit, go back a little bit to the numbers and just remind us even some, um, some of the, those numbers translated into the, the Cleveland scene. Um, some work done actually recent, more recently by the Fund for Economic Future um, found that in 2016, white workers, so there's an issue of access to, to good jobs, right? So white workers were disproportionately represented in occupations like management, which pay higher wages on average, while workers of color disproportionately represented in occupations like healthcare support, which pay lower average, lower wages. Um, and then, uh, but you also find that um, white workers and African American workers earn their differential in earnings in the same occupation. Um, so a white worker in management occupation earned an estimated 85,000 annually, while a worker of color earned an estimated 66,000 annually on average. Um, so right there you see um, in the Cleveland MSA of the 69 billion earned in 2016 in compensation by workers, so through wages, 58 earned by white workers and 11 billion earned by workers of color. I mean, that's you can see how that feeds the the, the wealth gap for sure. Um, there are many many factors that we could um, that we can talk about that contributes to the wage gap. And the, of the three that you mentioned, actually, I want to touch on two. So one, um, I did want to focus on the role of the criminal justice system and the disparities in the criminal justice system. Um, and then how that contributes to um, the readiness to engage in um, with the level of jobs as well as um, and as well as you know earnings. So, um, black Ohioans are more likely to be arrested than white Ohioans, Ohioans for similar offenses, and are incarcerated at nearly six times the rate of white Ohioans. So black uh, represent 13 percent of the population of Ohio, but 44 percent of the prison population. African Americans use uh, and whites use drugs at similar rates. This is a national statistic, but the imprisonment rate of African Americans for drug charges is almost four times that of whites. So we could go on and on about the disparities in um, neighborhoods that are you're more likely to be picked up and then more likely to have higher charges and more likely to have longer sentences um, throughout that system. But then let's think about what happens when you get out. So once you're out and you've done your time, you still face something called collateral sanctions. So many rules and administrative rules and laws that limit your ability to access jobs or licensing, um, licenses that will lead to good jobs, et cetera. There's um, 850 laws and administrative rules that limit these job opportunities. So one in four Ohio jobs is blocked or restricted for those with, with a conviction. Those jobs affected by collateral sanctions pay $4,700 less or more on average and are growing at twice the rate of other jobs. Um, I'm sorry, jobs affected by collateral sanctions pay 4700 less on average. <laughs> um, so again, all these limitations, once you're out and paid your time, then you have a less access to good jobs um, and less access to jobs that pay well. And then some national research that shows that serving time reduces hourly wages for men by 11%, annual employment by nine weeks, annual earnings by 40%. So the, the, the implications of these upstream things on the ability um, and the disproportionate impact on African Americans plays, plays out significantly. Um, just quickly, I'd say the, um, talking about the uh, discrimination in, um, in the labor market. Um, towards Employment um, and uh, some partners ran a, a program that was um, focused on skills-based hiring. So the idea was um, that you could, um, jobs were analyzed for the skills needed. You could take a test to assess um, whether or not you had those skills. And so the idea was to equalize um, a bit the, the playing field. So it was not so much um, your educational credentials, years of experience. You could really focus, do you really have the skills to do this job? So um, we had over 1,000 test takers um, and disaggregated the results by race. So 940 people secured employment, and black and white participants secured employment at equal rates. 
So that's pretty exciting in a sense that because black unemployment rate in Northeast Ohio is three times that of the white unemployment rate. However, African Americans earn just 49% of white employed participants overall. And white individuals with the lowest scores ended up earning over 5,000 more annually than black participants with the highest scores, a differential of nearly 20%. This is a very small sample, um, but this is just to, to demonstrate that um, the, barriers, the barriers are many. And so when you start unpacking that, um, and you think about what's going on um, with the decisions to hire, about where you're um, somebody with similar skills um, and uh, what opportunities they are offered, and that goes into unconscious bias um, and um, understanding the systemic nature of racism that is contributing to this. And so we have a, a lot to unpack and a lot of work to do to start changing the trajectory of that line. Our next question from one of our for one of our panelists, what has been done and what has worked? <laughs> what has been done and what has worked? Well, um, I think that in some ways it feels like uh, for every step forward we, we take two steps backwards, but I, I, I would I would say that things have been tried, right? Things have been attempted. Uh, you know, the, the, the fund for our future, to go back to them, has was put together to try to figure out how to help a, a region compete. Um, that hadn't been done before. Uh, cities and, and, count, uh, and counties throughout Northeast Ohio, because there's 18 counties in the, the fund's footprint, uh, we're talking for the first time. And uh, I think um, for all the challenges that the fund has faced, you know, I, I would say that uh, it was something that has been attempted and that there are certain areas that they're starting to figure out, like workforce and the importance of things like transportation, a lot of investment in studying uh, why people of color can't find employment is the fact that the bulk of the jobs are in places far and away from where people that need the jobs reside. So you have Solon and Westlake and places like that that have the bulk of the jobs, and then the urban core, of course, having the higher percentages of people that are unemployed that, that can't get there. Um, so I, I think um, being creative in, in that regard is, is um, the, the right approach to this. I don't know if um, we figured a lot of it out because um, the you know Cleveland is still you know number one in poverty, um, childhood poverty in the nation, and. Um, we, we know that uh, we have our challenges with uh, you know employment, and uh, as Jill said, we know far too many um, ex-offenders can't get plugged back into uh, employment. But I, I do applaud you know organizations like Towards Employment that has sort of pounded you know uh, the table to s insist that uh, employers think differently about how they uh, accept and embrace um, ex-offenders, and there has been some success with that. I know that. Um, one example would be, uh, Jill can talk about your good work at university hospitals and sort of uh, taking a neighborhood approach to uh, finding people and placing them into uh, companies close to where they live uh, that also are in the high demand sectors like healthcare. So um, I think that that's you know, a pretty important uh, thing to uh, highlight. So take it away, Jill. Um, so I, I, I there's so many angles to, to approach this. And so um, talking about I, I, continuing a little bit maybe on the theme of um, employer practice, uh, and then um, maybe going into, so we, we talk about supply side and demand side. Very often, we're always talking about fixing, fixing the supply side. People aren't ready. They don't have the skills. Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's talk about sort of employers and openness to, um, uh, openness to hire. Uh, and being more creative about what it means to seek out talent and uh, be, create a welcoming culture and um, contribute to um, closing some of the gaps that exist perhaps um, uh, because of um, poverty in neighborhoods or poor performing schools um, because um, talent is needed and so we need to partner to get there. Um, so 
just uh, continuing on the skills-based hiring theme, I just wanted to, to mention um, an example, actually, in um, Michigan, um, Mercy Health Medical Systems, that really did an, a thorough revision of the way in which they hired and the way in which they um, um, advanced uh, people within their, their workplace. And they used this evidence-based selection. Um, and so they took away, uh, it was designed to try to reduce um, bias in their hiring and um, professional development systems. Um, and what they found was um, they, their first year turnover reduced from 25% to 19%. Um, their time to fill uh, was reduced from 37 to 31 days. But the real goal here is that their hiring diversity increased from um, increase from 17% to 38%, which exceeded, so the region is 21% non-white. So by introducing a new approach to how they sought talent, they evaluated talent, they promoted talent, they supported talent, they were able to create more opportunities for and a more diverse workforce, and their bottom line improved. Right, so I, there's a. I think there are real win-win there, and there are known approaches. Um, and so, how do we get more people embracing this? And I would like to congratulate. I think um, in our community, um, with there's been a, a significant effort to help um, in, encourage um, people from across our community to participate in racial equity. Um, training and really raising awareness of the historic nature, the systemic nature. And I think sometimes that that is a, awareness is the first step. And then how do you turn that um, awareness into action in your own practices? Um, Randy mentioned, um, so there are many approaches to thinking about, again, going back to sort of the day-to-day, -day, who are the people today who uh, we need to help prepare for the jobs so that their earnings will increase and they, be, they can begin to accumulate wealth. Um, and so just to call out sort of this anchor-based economic development strategy in our community, um, an example is um, the Greater University Circle uh, neighborhood where um, these large institutions, in this case the hospital, really embrace the idea of a local hire strategy. Um, so really thinking you're surrounded, here's this economic engine surrounded by low-income communities. How do we create more opportunities for people who live in those communities who can literally walk to work? Um, and so uh, I think that is a great strategy to be replicated. Um, I think um, we also have evergreen cooperatives in our community, which is um, the idea of an employee-owned um, enterprise that um, once you are hired and a member of the cooperative, it allows you to build wealth as the company su is successful. Um, and then uh, another initiative, um, which is um, sort of the, the idea, there's something called a sector partnership where employers are coming together um, and defining, trying to aggregate their needs and working together with community uh, partners to say, how can we be more transparent about what our needs are? How can we be more welcoming? How can we um, really help um, provide the input so you can develop a pipeline and prepare people who wouldn't otherwise be able to walk in the door and really invest in that person and help them be successful? And I know we have people in the room who can speak more to all of those initiatives that I just mentioned. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, <clears throat> maybe say a few words about um, I think residential segregation. So when I look at that, that income line and how flat it is, you know, I think about the fact that in our society, I think in the 60s, we kind of decided collectively that, you know, uh, a segregated society wasn't consistent with kind of our self-conception as a democratic society. And, you know, we managed to, you know, desegregate lunch counters uh, and water fountains. But in terms of residential segregation, if you just look at a map, and I mean, I think everyone, it's one of those things that's kind of in the air, everyone kind of already knows it. Um, you know, it's something that it's still with us today. And personally, I think that matters for a lot of reasons, mainly because of the kinds of environments, social networks uh, that kids grow up with, the kinds of uh, safety they have. So I thought it would probably be reasonable to, to mention the Gautreaux program. So there's this really interesting book called Waiting for Gautreaux that anyone, you know, in this audience probably would find interesting. So it was designed to desegregate public housing in Chicago, because if you looked at a map of where public housing in Chicago had been placed you know, in kind of the mid-1900s, it was very clear it was being done to intentionally segregate the city uh, by race. And this program 
moved uh, some, you know, some families to kind of high income majority white suburbs and some to within the city to neighborhoods that were supposed to be kind of getting some kind of investments and supposed to be having an upward trajectory because of that. And what you found from as a result of this is that kids that went to kind of high income suburbs, there was a transition period. You know, it was tough for them. A lot of the times they were maybe the only black kid in their class. Uh, but over time, our country grew. So they actually became integrated. They realized, oh, I have to do homework at night. You know, th their, their grades took a dip at, at the start, but then they, they managed to catch up. Uh, and I mention this because right now there's actually a, you know, a lot of work talking about public housing as a way to kind of deconcentrate poverty and maybe potentially even desegregate the country. But I think beyond even whether we want to think about moving people around or not, uh, what I think this really shows is the environments that we create for our kids uh, really matters for their economic success, also their you know, psychological success, all kinds of things that we think about. So, you know, you think about things like the Harlem Children's Zone that we were trying to replicate in, I believe, originally 50 cities uh, that got scaled back to five. But, you know, the Harlem Children's Zone is a neighborhood-based program that just had amazing results uh, for kids. And I think if we try to focus on, you know, things like community-based policing to keep kids safe, any kind of intervention, I think, to kind of improve the environment where kids are growing up, I think is going to just improve, uh, you know, their outcomes and maybe have some some way to affect that, you know, trajectory of that of that income earning gap. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to talk less about what's been done and more about what probably should be done. Uh, and I'm going to plug one of my favorite colleagues at the University of Virginia, uh, Sarah Turner, who ran an experiment to determine why there was a gap in elite school enrollment. And one thing they found was a lot of students don't apply to elite schools because they don't really understand the gain associated with going to a top school versus a state school. And they vastly overestimate the price. And so I think delivering, inf it turns out delivering information about the right way to get on a high income tra trajectory uh, is pretty cheap and is going to be effective at addressing the, this elite school gap. So that, that's something, it's not expensive. It would be easy to scale up. And I suspect it will have, you, it will have large effects. OK. We will continue our program. And this is the part of the program we'll, where we are opening questions from audience members. So if you have a question, please step up to one of the microphones in the aisles in front of you, and we'll begin Q&A. Come on. OK. Please introduce yourself and who you represent tonight. Good afternoon. My name, oh, good evening. I'm Richard Bazil. I am a, a dean at Tri-C, the Metropolitan Campus. My question is, so what? I mean, why does this matter? Why don't we just leave everything the same? What's the difference? What, what, you know, we've been going this way for over 50 years, right? So why should we change this? Anyone can answer. I, I would say uh, we won't compete as a nation globally if we don't change. There's too many bright people being left behind that might have the next cure for cancer or might be the next uh, president of the United States or the next chief economist. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we forget that, that um, uh, there's so much talent, there's so much value in people that we're just sort of pushing aside by allowing this to continue. I was going to say something very similar. There's a vast amount of human capital so human capital is our obnoxious term for what people know and what they know how to do that we're just simply wasting. Um, the, the evidence is that black households have similar levels of human capital and they are paid substantially less and that causes disincentives. We're wasting an enormous amount of our human wealth. Can I because I know we're amongst economists, but can I just say justice? Thank you. 
Our next question, please introduce yourself and who you represent. Yes, my name is Dr. Linda Holt. I am an independent uh, consultant and researcher, but I do work extensively in the automotive industry. I have 21 years experience there as a financial executive. So that's my background. Uh, what I'd like to ask regarding tonight's uh, presentation is, uh, let's say if we control for incarceration and throw that out of the picture and examine just blue collar and lower income working population of black Americans, has anyone addressed the fact that perhaps the supply of labor in their strata has affected the, er the, the depression of earnings uh, since 1965? The fact that there is an expansion of the labor force in their strata of um, the labor um, population that might have kept earnings low. Anyone feel free to answer? Any of our panelists? Yeah, it might, it might be good if you uh, could clarify. So one, one potential response is just the fact that, uh, you know, I think with, with automation and uh, and trade that I think certain parts of the of the of the labor force have been differentially impacted. Is is that what you mean, or do you mean something else? For, for clarity, as you know, contiguous with the Civil Rights Act was also an expansion of immigration into the United States. So the labor force as a whole in the country, in terms of lower middle and blue collar uh, populations has expanded. So when we look at the earnings gap, has anyone tried to isolate the effect on black American earnings of a wider immigration pattern that has caused competi competition within certain levels of work? That's my question. Is that easier to understand? Thank you. So. I I'm not aware of any research on that directly, but I'm sure, I'm sure it's it's out there. Um, yeah, and I'll I guess I'll leave it at that. Hello, my name is Melanie Long. I'm an assistant professor of economics at the College of Worcester. Um, quick question: uh, Based on your, I, so I'll start with a definition. So we talked about uh, wealth, and wealth is generally defined in terms of net worth, right? So a difference between assets and liabilities. Um, I'm curious if there's been any attempts in research or any kind of things you've noticed anecdotally, anyone on the panel, in terms of the relationship between debt and this wealth, racial wealth gap. Because when we know that there's um, clear structural inequality in access to low-cost credit services in communities of color, plus the impacts of, like, say, income volatility on reliance on debt, is there any extent to which debt's compounding this racial wealth gap or cont contributing to this persistence? Um, so we didn't show it in the talk for, for time purposes, but if you look at the entire distribution of wealth, 62 to 2016, what you see is there's a much bigger increase in black households with negative net worth positions. And that is, so there's, there's kind of two sides to this story. On the one side, they are able to borrow more but on the other side, it's also the case that there's been a substantial increase in the income risk that they face. Not just the fact that they, uh, their unemployment process is significantly more uncertain, but also wages when they are working are significantly more uncertain. So uh, in the interest of not trying to bite off too much in one step, we, we, uh, we put that aside for now, but we're, it's definitely on our list of to do because I think it's really important. And there's, there's also, I, I may be getting too far afield here, but um, there's also substantial differences in the way that black households deal with bankruptcy situations that, has just, that just hasn't been looked into yet, but it's on our radar. Thank you. We'll take two more questions, sir. Uh, good evening and thank you. Uh, I'm Alan Weinstein. I'm a professor of law and urban studies at Cleveland State University. Uh, so as you're aware, uh, the Fannie Lewis law uh, in Cleveland uh, it has been struck down. Um, it, it, there will be an appeal, but the prospects don't look good. 
Uh, furthermore, uh, it appears that uh, affirmative action uh, in employment and in government contracting uh, is uh, one case away uh, from being struck down uh, by the uh, conservative members of the court. Uh, what do we do when those laws are no longer available? Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I guess I would start very big picture, and I would just say uh, I would, you know, try to push for creating a society where everyone has opportunity, where there's a quality of opportunity, uh, and trying to push in that direction. Um, in terms of those specific, you know, that specific legislation, I don't, you know, I think in terms of how to mitigate the, the impact of that, I don't have any direct uh, comments. I don't know if others do. I would just say very briefly, we vote. And we hold elected officials accountable and let them know that we're paying attention and, and we're not going to stand for it. And um, that typically can lead to change. And I would add that um, locally, at least, um, there with the Fannie Lewis law, there are examples of employers voluntarily um, t you know, embracing those targets. And so how are we pressuring, if it's not going to be legislative, what are the other pressure points to encourage um, that kind of participation? And our final question of the night. Hi, thank you. Amber Lewis, Key Bank. My question is, you know, great information tonight, but where do you all stand on the death of the black business? So as we're having this conversation about wages, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the, the whole idea is that no one's coming to save you, you have to save yourself. So when we did have the times of segregation, we basically leaned on each other to ensure that we were buying from each other. We had a mentality of creating our own wealth. We had Black Wall Street and things like that. Um, in this new paradigm shift of working for others and expecting a paycheck to come, we may never be able to fill that wealth gap if we're relying on wages. So what are we going to do to make sure that our black businesses are at the same place that the white businesses are in society? Don't all, not everyone raise your microphones at once. Well, um, so I'm not so sure about what we can do, but I think that's actually a, a really important point, because if you start looking at the top end of the wealth distribution, it is disproportionately populated by people who claim self-employment. Um, so that is a mechanism by which you can generate wealth. Now, it's risky, so there is there has to be kind of some safeguards, but that is, that's exactly right. The, the extent to which we are, we, we have a, a, it's the economy, my friend John Halteringer calls it the decline of business dynamism. And that seems to be even more dramatically the case for African-American businesses. That's important. That matters going forward for wealth building. I would just add that um, <clears throat> growing businesses to scale is difficult for, for any type of business. And uh, we probably would do uh, much help if we could at least help um, smaller minority businesses to grow, to get connected to business opportunities, to get connected to communities, to uh, get whatever training or workforce development support or whatever they need to, to just you know go from a sole proprietor situation to maybe having five to seven employees. All the research shows that people of color are more, more likely to hire other people of color. And I think um, piece by piece, maybe we start to move the needle slightly, but um, I can tell you just, you know, growing to a large corporation level is very, very difficult um, for majority population as well as uh, minority populations. And just, uh, is this working? Yeah, there we go. And just one more thing I would, I would want to add on that in that I don't necessarily think we need to just think about business or just think about wages. You know, different people are going to make different choices for how they want to turn their income. But thinking about uh, the last point about neighborhoods and unequal neighborhoods. So if you think about small businesses and where they're located, you know, a lot of people are going to locate those small businesses in neighborhoods in which they live, in which they reside. And if there's big disparities in, for instance, labor income and earnings for the people that you live around, and because we still have very segregated communities, um, it all sort of interacts, right? So the demand side 
is weak as well because the income's not there. So it could really, you know, addressing this wage gap as well as targeting ways to grow businesses um, that, are, that are minority run and minority owned could actually lead to a virtuous cycle where they feed on each other. Thank you. Okay, don't accuse me of fake news, but we have one final question. I promise. Thank you for taking my question. My name is LaShonda Lee, and I'm a homeowner. I'm an Army veteran. And one of the greatest things just happened to me, I just graduated from a program here in Cleveland called Red All Green Partnership. And I'm happy to see Mr. McShepard here because he's one of the co-founders. He was at my graduation on Saturday. So, um, <laughs> yay. Another thing that I'm proud of is that I am not a person of color. I'm not an African American or all these other labels that people put on me. I am an American descendant of slaves. So when you talk about the black wealth gap and what is behind it, one thing that I know is that what's going to stop it is this simple thing, and it's called reparations. It's the one thing I have not heard here today. I've been a do-for-selfer. I've been self-employed. I have my own businesses. Um, I've gone to college. Like I say, I've been in the military. But as I look across the country, from California to wherever the military has taken me, from the south where I'm from, Alabama, I see the same things. No matter what we do, we go to school, we go to the military, we have our own businesses. Nothing is going to help us but our government. My people, American descendants of slaves, when you say that word black, it encompasses a whole bunch of people. It encompasses Africans, it encompasses Caribbean people, but when you see American descendants of slaves, meaning that we have bones of our ancestors buried here, that's what we're talking about. That's that racial wealth gap for the people that have been here who helped make that, who helped build this country. So to this platform, where do you stand on reparations for my people? And I would like to hear from each and every one of you. Which one of you are the, is the economist? <laughs> You're the economist? Or all three of you? Okay. Have you heard of a work by William Sandy, Dar William Sandy Darity out of Duke University? He talks about reparations and how it's going to heal our people. And reparations, as you know, if you read his work, it's not just about money. It's about lineage therapy. So I'm going to be quiet now. I'm going to listen to you, the economist. Tell us how and what you think about reparations and how it's going to heal our American nation. Reparations is going to repair our nation. The Achilles heel of this country is slavery. And that's what's behind the persistent wealth gap in this nation. Thank you. So thank you for the comment. So I guess, um, you know, as an economist on the stage, uh, I think what I would say is, you know, I think part of the, the motivation for what we're doing is, uh, you know, so I think reparations is a word that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. When I think about it, I think about it in terms of, you know, Ta-Nehisi Coates', Coates piece where it says it's you know, really a full reckoning with our history as a country. Um, and so I would just say that you know, I think that's really, yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of what you said that I, I find it very hard to disagree with, that uh, you know, in terms of the specifics, we might have disagreements or we might have to have a conversation, but in terms of having that full reckoning with our history and kind of where we are, like I said, I mean, I think you know, one of the comments was what about justice, and I think you know, for me, you know, we can talk about, you know, kind of full participation and competition and what it means for the wealth of our country, but I think it's also about kind of what country are we going to be going forward. Uh, so in that sense, I, I really appreciate your comment. And I, I would just say, yeah, that I, I agree that's really a, a motivation for us trying to think about this. Uh, and then in terms of, you know, the specifics of how we go about kind of repairing where we are, um, I, I hope that this research is starting a conversation about that. Um, so... Uh one uh, aspect of Sandy's research that, uh, that I, I, I'm aware of is there are psychological consequences for this inequality. And those have long-lasting scarring effects on, on the labor market. And so we had kind of the idea of, of 
Well, we'll take the, you know, we, in the, we, we thought of the exercise of equalizing the initial conditions as the monetary side of reparations. And we found that just isn't going to do it. That's going to return us to the situation that we were in very rapidly because it doesn't, under, it doesn't address this other side of things. And one thing I think is really important is, you know, when you go to work and you see two people, you, know, you see somebody else doing your job and getting paid essentially twice as much, that has long-term consequences. Uh, the psychologists uh, have a bunch of terms that I don't really remember, but the conclusion is this stuff matters, and we're going to have to do something about it. It's part of why earnings are unequal. And you know, I hope what we've done is at least start pushing the direction, the, the discussion towards something that's going to have long-lasting improvements. Um, okay, so I guess it's it's my my turn. <laughs> it's, it's three at three. Um, so when I think of, of Sandy Darity's work and, and Derek Hamilton and others, uh, I think about baby bonds, for instance, his baby bond ideas. Um, again, just actually in some way I would address the, you know, the business ownership question. I mean, these don't have to be exclusionary policies. They're not mutually exclusive approaches. Okay, so I don't I don't necessarily. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm open, I guess, to ideas for, for different wealth transfers in different ways. I'm open to it as an economist. Of course, I like to study it and think about it and what different consequences might be under different situations, right? But um, I do feel, you know, from, from the research that I've done so far that, and that, and that we've done, um, that, again, we can't I, – I guess I'm not trying to give the whole picture today. I'm not trying to say this is all it is, and I'm not saying I'm not open to, to other policies. Um, and I don't. I can see where these policies could actually work with each other, right? If we could, for instance, take that model and run that experiment where we equalized everything immediately, but also have closed the labor income gap experiment, we did both of them, the racial wealth gap wouldn't have been there. It would have been zero the entire way. So these things don't have to be mutually exclusive. They can work together, particularly if you think about wealth helping feed into differences in earnings later, right? So there's a lot of room for, for a discussion about that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for your questions. We could possibly go on and on and on tonight with so many questions, but it would be great for you to continue these conversations and discussions in your neighborhoods and in your line of work so we can continue this discussion beyond this room. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. This program will be uploaded to the Fed's website in a few days, so to be sure to visit the website clevelandfed.org. Again, thank you all for coming out tonight and get home safely.